Welcome back to the Context Coaching Podcast. We are joined today by the legendary Herm Edwards, Monterey Peninsula native, former collegiate, former NFL coach. So blessed to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. Well, well, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, I've given the you've given me this opportunity to speak, uh, especially about coaching. I, I think it's uh, it's vital uh, in sport, regardless of. Um, what sports you may co uh, coach. Uh, I think a coach and player, there's a unique bond when it comes to that. Uh, I learned that long ago uh, from my first football coach was Dan Albert. Uh, and that man meant a whole lot to me. And, and I didn't know it at that time until I left and continued to play football. And, you know, when I got into the coaching profession, there was a lot of things that he taught me at the high school level at the high school level that I just took for granted and just kind of, but, you know, and, and I think every coach is, is a, as a reflection of the men or women that have coached them somewhere in their careers. And for me, it was Dan Albert, my high school coach. It was learned a lot from Marty Schottenheimer, um, you know, working with him, Claude Gilbert, uh, was my college coach and gave me my first job actually at San Jose state. Uh, when I retired in 86, uh, then I went to Kansas City, uh, worked for Marty for a while. Uh, and then Tony Dungy was a good friend. He, uh, we we came out of college at the same time together. Uh, he went to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I played for the Eagles. He started coaching a little bit before I did. Uh, and we were really good friends. And then he brought me down to Tampa, made me assistant head coach, and really taught me how to become a head coach. And then from there, you, you, your career kind of goes. But I can just remember the steps of it all. Um, it was people giving me an opportunity. And, and I think when I got into the profession, the thing that I always looked at was I want to make sure I give young guys opportunity because coaching is a matter of not so much what you know, it's who you know. That's how you get opportunities. And it's a profession too where it's a little cliquish at times. And, and guys are going to hire their friends. And people say, why do they do that? Well, because they can trust them and they know them. You know, and, that, and that's part of the deal, too. And when you don't know uh, guys, then, 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 you know, you might interview them, but you don't know them. And you always are asking for uh, information on coaches you may hire or coaches, you know, that, that you've seen from afar. And it's not so much of you being a good coach or not. It's just there's this trust factor because – in coaching, the thing you realize is that you cannot be in every room. Uh, some coaches micromanage. I don't. I, 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 you know, I delegate. I want to trust guys. I bring young guys in the pipeline because of the opportunities that I was afforded. And I understand there's a pipeline, especially for young minority coaches. You know, it, 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 it's hard. It's hard. And someone has to be a vehicle to give them an opportunity. That was given to me. And so I understood stood that uh, when I became a coach. And to be quite honest, my intentions were never to be a head coach. That was never my intentions. I, I, I could care less about being a head coach. I was fine coaching the secondary <laughs> with my guys. I was good. <laughs> but as I continued to grow, um, and when I went to Tony, Tony Flat told me, look, I'm bringing you here. Um, you're the assistant head coach. I'm going to put you in position where you're going to have an opportunity to be the head coach. And lo and behold, it happened. Uh, I had you know two jobs as a head coach in the National Football League, and then went to then went to Arizona State and had another opportunity. Um, so I've been blessed. You know, when you think about football, uh, I tell people all the time, I've never really had a job. I was a good enough athlete to play, uh, and then from there, a good enough athlete to go into the profession and then coach. And when I reflect on it, I spent probably college and pro football 40 years coaching and playing, right? So hopefully in, in that time, I know this, when I was able to give opportunities and bring young guys along, I did that. Um, get coordinators jobs to be head coaches. I was involved in that as well. So. That makes me feel good that I get guys opportunity. Did I win enough games? You never win enough games. <laughs> That's just how it is as a coach. You never win enough, right? 
And, and there's, there were some good seasons. There were some bad seasons. But I think you find out a lot about who you are when you're a coach, because I've always said this. You make a lot of decisions. And you make all the decisions. But how they play, you can't control that. You got to trust them. That's the hardest part about coaching. The great thing about playing, you can do something about it when you play. And that was the hardest thing for me as a coach. I can't play for these guys. I can make all the decisions, but I have no control of how they're going to play. I can compare them, and that's at every level. That's at college, high school, professional football. Doesn't matter what sport you coach. When you become the coach, you have all the control, but you have no, you, you make, excuse me, you make all the decisions, but you have no control of how they're going to play. No doubt. No doubt. Let me um, follow up with this coach. You <clears throat> mentioned that Tony Dungy had told you, I'm going to get you ready to be a head coach. Yes. And then you followed that opportunity with your first head coaching job with the Jets. A question I always ask, because I originally designed this as a digital database of mentorship for coaches, is even with all that preparation, right? You're at San Jose State, then you're with the Chiefs, then you're with the Bucks. Now you're the head coach. You should be ready to go. But what did you realize right away that you still needed to figure out? Well, basically, how you're going to make decisions, right? Because everyone's looking at you to make a decision. You, you, you get to make the, you have the final say. And, you know, when you're a position coach, it's easy because you're coaching your position. When you're a coordinator, you're coaching the defense. When you're the head coach, you're coaching the coaches, you're coaching the players. You got a lot of decisions to be, to make, right? And it's funny because I tell people this story, um, you know, being under Tony, you know, just watching him and asking, always asking him questions. You always got to ask why. That's knowledge. When you ask why, you're searching for knowledge. And now you can't be the guy, the thing I learned too, you can't be the guy that you mentor under. You got to be you. You got to be you. I mean, you can't be somebody else. All right. And, and so you got to understand that. And there's certain things that Tony did that, you know, I agreed with and certain things I might have done different. And I understood all that. And so gathering all this information from Tony, and I can remember when I became the head coach of the Jets, and you go out on the field, and not, you know, you're the head coach, and this is the first game. It's, it's in the preseason. And I walked out on the field, and I'm kind of looking around, and I'm going, hmm. And it dawned upon me. I mean, Tony taught, he went from A to Z. And from Z back to A. And the thing, when I walked out on the field, I asked myself this question. I said, you know what I didn't ask him? Where do I stand in the warm-up? I didn't know where to stand. Right? I was kind of figuring out where do I go now? Because generally, in football, I was either the position coach and I was coaching my players, or I was the player and I was doing drills. But I was never the head coach. So you're always doing something. When you're the head coach, you don't do anything. You just walk out there, you shake the other head coach's hand, you talk to a couple of guys, and then you're standing out there for about 15 minutes and you're trying to figure out, where do I stand? And I'm going, I started almost laughing, right? I'm trying to be halfway cool. I'm walking around and go, I got no idea where to stand. <laughs> I called Tony up after the game. I said, TD, you didn't tell me where to stand, man. <laughs> <laughs> he started laughing. I didn't know where to stand, right? It is it, little things like that, right? Because I don't, you don't want to stand on a 50-yard line. And it's like, I don't want to stand on the side. So I figured it out. I kind of went back by the goalpost and kind of leaned on the goalpost a little bit, you know, and kind of kind of got out of the way. But um, boy, that it was just, I started laughing to myself. I said, man, you don't even know where to stand. How you going to coach this game today, right? That's funny. That's such a good story. And it also brings me back to what you mentioned in your opening, which is you are a delegate and trust guy. Yes. So I think that adds more to that equation of, well, these guys are doing their job. What am I supposed to be doing? Because you've already prepared them at that point. So talk a little bit about how you get to that approach of delegation and trust. Well, I think the overall theme is 
um, what type of culture do you have, right? And I think culture is measured on your team. You want the, and I've always felt this way, and some coaches don't believe in this. I wanted to give the players a voice. They, they needed to have a voice. I reflect back to when I was a player. I played under the master sergeant, Dick Vermeer, right, in pro football. I love that man. But, I mean, it was like, we're doing it this way. This is how we're doing it. <laughs> right? And I love him for it. Now, he lightened up. He lightened up. When he went to the Rams, he was a different Dick Vermeer than when he was with the Eagles. Right? He came out of college football. He went to he came to Philadelphia. But I, he learned a lesson, I think. We all learn lessons as we coach. We think we know everything and we don't. And that's the great, that's the greatest part of, about coaching. You always you, you're always gaining knowledge, right? Two weeks. And you only gain knowledge and how you get experience, you actually got to do it. And so I think the culture that you said is very important. My 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 pet peeve to players and even the coaches, I will treat everyone fairly, but I won't treat everyone the same because that's life. I'm not going to treat the nine-year veteran like I'm treating a rookie. Nine-year veteran has proven he's a, he's a professional football player. A rookie don't know how to be a professional football player. He has no idea. So I'm going to trust that guy, right? A little bit more. And, and guys understand that you have to earn trust, right? That, that, that's just part of it. And you got to earn respect, right? And there's this dialogue that that continues to go, right? And it's not so much, you know, it's uh, trust them on the field, you know, off the field. It's just it's just part of it. And and I think when you have a culture like that, it's healthy because the players feel, you know, what we have some entitled. We're not entitled, but we do have a voice in the, in, in this in this team. And and rosters vary according to what team, you know, you you inherit as a coach, right? Um, you have some veteran players, you got some rookie players, then there's this in-between guys, right? And, and in pro football, all the player wants to know is this, what is this coach going to do to keep me in the league? The rookie's trying to figure out how am I going to get in the league? The players, the veteran guy's going to say, is this dude doing stuff, to, is he going to cut me, right? Because there's a finality to this. And you know, and I wrote this down, and, and it's it's interesting, and it starts at starts at the high school level, junior high school level. Athletes are a sum of what parents, coaches, teachers contribute to them in their lives. The way they respond to success and failure in sports and in life will be one of your greatest challenges as a coach. That will be your greatest challenge. It is the it's the great the success and failure. How does the athlete deal with that? And how do you respond to it? That to me was very important at every level that I've ever coached. At every level. Because there are athletes are some of all those parts, right? I mean, we just are because how we grow up how the education system works, how you start from junior high school, elementary, Pop Warner, whatever, and it's just kind of those three factors are involved in your life. No doubt. And I think that the way you handle, as you said, the success or failure, right? What is your approach to a mistake response, right? And how do you teach not just athletes, coach, but hell, our children, right? The the next generation of humans, like how are we navigating success and failure is ultimately going to impact society. And you said earlier, uh, I'm going to treat everybody fair, but not equally. And this is something I tell kids all the time. Fair is not equal. It right. is, you know, it's you are capable of X. They are capable of Y. You are going to be able to do what you've proven that you can do. And yes. until you do that, you are going to be in a space where we feel you can excel. Um, right. and we're going to help you figure that out. Um, I, I'm curious. So Jets job, Chiefs job, and then we took a hiatus. And then we came back in at the college level. What did those, uh, what, 10 years of being an analyst and, and not necessarily being directly involved as a head coach 
do for you when you stepped back in from a perspective standpoint, from a skill set standpoint? How did your approach change after that time off? Well, you see the game different now. You're looking at it from a different view, right? Because now you're sitting back and actually, you know, generally when you're coaching, you're always coaching to either win your division, um, you're worried about your division, you're looking at your roster, you're looking at uh, the people you play. But when you sit from afar, you watch everybody. And so you have a different perspective. You watch games differently. Because now you're looking at how a coach may coach their offense or defense. You're seeing certain things that before you were so focused on what you needed to do to prepare your football teams, you don't pay a whole lot of attention to what everybody else is doing because you got your own deal to deal with, right? You don't have that much time in the day. But when you sit back, you watch college football, you watch pro football, you just watch it and you go, wow, this is interesting, right? Like RPO, the RPO game all of a sudden. It it worked its way into pro football. You would never even think about doing that when I first started. That was like, get the quarterback hit? What? You can't do that in pro football. That, that, that ain't, that's not an option. Well, half the quarterbacks in the NFL now run a little bit of the RPO. So I just think it changes and the game has changed. The game went from playing 75% inside the numbers with the run game, pounding people, to now they spread you out. They'll throw 45 passes in the game. That's nothing anymore, right? That's just that's just what we do. <laughs> and so the quarterback has really changed the game dramatically. I mean, it's, yeah. Look, the running back is, is, is now devalued. Why is he devalued? Because when you run RPOs, the quarterback can run as good as the running backs. So why do you need a running back? You need him in short yardage. You need him in certain situations. But the quarterback is a good runner as well. And he can throw the football. So it's just the game has really, really changed. Let me ask this. It seems like <clears throat> as a novice football fan in, in my space, I'm a basketball dude, but ultimately it seems like the professional level is the last group to innovate meaning like the colleges try things the high schools try right. things and then you said the rpo finally made its way into the pro game what are the things that now that you're out of it again for a little bit that you're seeing and going like man the pros should adopt this right now but their their traditions are getting in the way of it well i just think you mentioned tradition and money how you pay players it's, and pro football is different. You pay these guys. Well, I shouldn't. Well, in college football, you get to pay them now too. So <laughs> that's changed as well. So we'll see how that goes. But, but you know, a lot of old souls in football. But the, in, but the innovation of young coaches that come out of college programs are a part of it now. And you can see it on certain teams, right? You just watch it unfold. You watch this thing and you go, hmm, this is interesting. And, and now you got to look, your greatest asset is to develop systems where your players can be successful. So rather than to fight it and say, I don't want to do that, I got a handful of players that can do this. They do it really well. Then I my, my system has to be flexible enough to entertain that and say, okay. Now, I still believe this, and this is always the case, and this I don't think will ever change. To score, you have to throw the ball because you get big chunks. But you got to run to win. You still have to have the ability to run. When The Detroit Lions are a throwback team. The San Francisco 49ers are throwback teams, right? They run the ball. They play action pass. They're balanced, right? They, that still wins, by the way. That still wins. But a lot of these teams now, three wide outs, tight end. I mean, you know, it, it, and, and the older teams that still run two tight ends have a fullback. People say fullback. What is that? The, the teams that still do that, they win. And it's interesting because they can control the game because of how they play. That format for me travels. 
It plays in all conditions. What also travels is good defense. You still have to have some toughness up front. And that's why the model won't change a whole lot. The big men on either side of the ball are the key. You can get skill guys. There are skill guys walking all over the place, right? It, it, they're, they're, I mean, they're skill guys, but it's the big guys, the big athletic guys that play on their feet. When you look at teams that are successful, just look at that and you'll go, hmm, okay, right? It's just, it, now they're bigger, they're more athletic. We get it. You mentioned, it's funny, you mentioned, well, you're a basketball guy. Well, I'll tell you this about basketball, a little bit I know about basketball. Well, when did you ever think that a seven-foot player is shooting three-pointers? It's like, really? Can dribble like a point guard. It's like, get out of here. How do they do that? Right? The game is like, it's an open game now. It's just open. Everybody can dribble and shoot. And it's just, oh, it's, it's, they don't throw the ball in the paint anymore. It's in the paint. They throw it out there for a three point shot. It's like, really? Right. It's so it's the modern day athlete in today's era, because of at a young age now, all these leagues and things they're involved in, throwing the ball, shooting the ball, playing, playing bait, all these, they grow up at a younger age understanding this and they're more developed. They're, they're, they're more athletic than 25 years ago. And they're bigger, right? And so you don't get dubbed, hey man, you know, you're six eight, you gotta play center. No, I wanna, I actually wanna play go, I wanna play the swing forward over there, coach, because I can shoot. And you go, well, I need a center. Well, I don't know about that. I can dribble and shoot. <laughs> I want to play out there. So it's just amazing how sports has kind of changed. Yeah, and the innovation of all that stuff took place at the lower levels, right? When yes. coaches began to say, all right, cool. You can dribble it. You can shoot it. Go play out there. Hey, defensively, yeah. I still need you to guard the big dude, but like ultimately get loose, right? You yeah. took yeah. somebody taking a calculated risk to help these athletes realize I don't have to be pigeonholed anymore. Like no. were when, when we were younger. Right. And it's your job to make the, uh, the player successful. Correct. That's your number one. That's your number one criteria. How right. can I make this player successful? I, I got to play to his skill set. Yeah. All right. Let me go back to something you said earlier about it's all about what kind of culture you want to create. And what mm -hmm. I generally ask is what's the best thing you do in your program or programs over the years that has always come with you? And should you coach again would be a hallmark of what you do. And it can be a tangible like I've often said, the best thing that we do on our program is that like our players hug each other before practice and after practice, before games, after games, because as young men, we're not taught to emote. We're not taught to do things like that. And so we try to break those things down, which ultimately, you know, L got to be around a lot last year and, and probably spoke to some of that and that the way in which the guys interact with one another. And so like, right. it's trivial, it has nothing to do with hoops, but it's something that I think it's been transformational for us. So what are some things that you've always done or you would continue to do that had the largest ripple effect on culture? You got to build trust. You know, and that and that's hard to do because you can't, you can't quantify it, right? I mean, at the end, they got to trust each other and they got to respect each other and they can all have different views. But I've always said this, when you walk into the huddle, it doesn't matter. You got to trust each other. Bottom line. And when you have trust, there's this, this there's a security of I can play freely now. Because I don't have to worry about it. Because there's 11 guys out there. There's 11 guys. Football is a crazy sport. There's 11 of them. There ain't three of them. They're not five. I'm in 11. And you can't play every position. And when the ball is snapped, either way, trust becomes a big deal. Right. And when you can create that on your field and the players run with it, because the players, what I've learned, and I learned this in Philadelphia, 
we had a really good defense. I mean, a really good defense. And in Tampa Bay, we had a really good defense. And if you walked into that huddle and they didn't trust you, you couldn't play. They didn't want you on the field. And they would tell the coaches that. They would flat tell the coach, no, 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 no. He ain't ready yet. Okay. And it, it's just, a, it's an amazing deal. And when you play like that, you can play freely as a player. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to, I don't know what this is. You don't have to think about it. Are you there? I'm here. I'm listening. Yes, sir. Okay, hold on. Let me see this. Hold on one second. Hello. 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 Good day. I'm no. Sorry. We can cut that out. Okay, we'll, we'll cut that out. Um, I love that anecdote about trust because what you just said, they would tell the player, the coaches, hey, he's not ready. And one of the cliches that I've used is when when athletes or parents are like, why is so-and-so not playing more? And it's like, you will play more when three, there are three no's, right? This is, I stole this from PGC. Uh, I know you should be playing more. You know you should be playing more. And your teammates know you should be playing more. And getting to all three of those is tough because yeah. ultimately if your teammates care about winning, like they're going to tell you and they're going to make it challenging for you to be a contributor. And it sounds like that's something that's very similar in your experience. Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, and I, I think the easiest thing to do and some, it, 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 it's the easiest thing to do, but sometimes the hardest thing because it's so easy. And I always tell people this. You know how trust is built? You listen to your eyes. That's it. It's not words. Just listen to your eyes. Watch them. That's all you got to do. And that's what I do. In practice, I see everything. And I just watch. And I'm gathering information because I'm listening. Because your eyes don't lie. <laughs> what you see is what you see. I mean, you can't. There's no debate on that. And I've always said, hey, man, you got a decision to make as a coach. When you go to practice with these guys, listen to your eyes. It'll tell you. You'll know. You can't deny that. Because it's staring you right in the face. You're looking at it. And then you got you to make the decision. Is it Yay. Or is it nay? And once you listen to your eyes and you say it's yay, that means, okay, you're on my trust. I'm good. No doubt. I love that. That's going to be something that I steal moving forward. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me, I'm curious again, mm -hmm. as a um, self-appointed assistant football coach, as the AD, uh, I make a lot of suggestions right. that may or may not hold water. Um, and you mentioned that, when you became the head coach, it became about decisions, right? And so yep. how involved, if you could teach me like I'm a kindergartner, as a, on a football staff where you have however many people, are you as the head coach in each decision that's being made, like subs going out or plays being called? No, or, hey, I'm no, calling a no. timeout. Talk that, me through the approach. That's all done. Look, it's done this way. You meet with your coordinators, with the offense, defense, special teams coach. And the first thing you sit down is, and this is this is when you're actually meeting and interviewing them for a job, right? You know where they've come from. You like their system, maybe, or or you want them to, or, or they're familiar with your system, however it works. But on defense, you know, there are certain systems you look at and you go, okay, I like that. And when you bring the guy in, you sit down and you talk about the system, right? Okay. And the first thing you got to know is the system is it flexible? Because if it's not flexible, then we got a problem. Because the players are the system, right? And the, 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 at the end of the day, the players are the system. It's not the system that's good. It's the players that make the system. So if the players are failing, then you got to ask yourself this question. Is the system too difficult? Or do these players not fit to what we're asking them to do? So then you got to decide, what do I want to do? Do I, do I massage the system or do I get rid of the players? Or is this coach not a fit? So there's, you got three decisions to make. 
generally you want to make you want to make the right one to benefit everybody. Sometimes that doesn't work. So with that being said, then when you have your meetings with coaches, you go, look, this is what I expect. You give them chip marks of this is what I like to do. Right now, you got to find a way to orchestrate this in what you do. And if you're struggling with it, I will help you. But this has got to be, I want them to be invested in it as well. I don't want them saying, hey, I'm running a coach's deal. No, 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 no. You're not running a coach's deal. Look, I always tell them this. You always have suggestions, right? There's always a suggestion. But they got to know, once I suggest things, you need to implement that. Because there comes a point to where it's no longer just a, a suggestion. It's this is what we're doing, right? And so you got to give them some leeway of, okay, you can still do your deal, but you better be able to do this. You better be able to run the football, right? You, 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 you... <laughs> On defense, you better you, you you have to find a way to stop the run, right? Th th there are certain caveats that they're they're built into the. To, I don't care whose system it is. These are the things that I'm looking at. We got to be smart. We don't beat ourselves with penalties. We don't turn the ball over. You know, certain things that you believe in. You say, guys, this is this is who I am as a whole. You got to understand that. And once they understand that, I say, now you go do your deal. I know what you're doing. I've, I've watched you coach defense. I've watched you coach offense. You were somewhere else. You know, this is why you're here on this, on this team now. But understand this. If I don't like something, it won't be a suggestion when I'm talking to you. It'll be, okay, we need to massage this a little bit, right? And so it's, 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 it's done in that manner. It's not done to intimidate, but it's at the end of the day, I'm the one responsible for all of it. You know, at the end, when it doesn't work, the guy that has to stand in front of the media is me. I got to answer the questions, right? And so with that being said, but I want coaches to have an input. I want them to feel good about what they're doing. And that's important to me because if they feel good, they'll make the players feel good, right? And so that's kind of how it works. Yeah. So – during the game, and I'm in the weeds here a little bit just because I'm so curious. As a head coach, mm -hmm. with everything lined up the way you've set it up, yep. how involved are you uh, in the weeds versus just conceptually and bringing energy and positivity, et cetera? Well, it, it, well with, when we formulate the game plan, generally what I used to do, I would sit with the offense and, and when, when they first install it on the first day. And kind of look at it. And I'd look at the run game, pass game, and then, you know, I'd go over to the defense. It didn't take me long with defense because I, I, that's just it's it's easy. I, you know, I know what they're doing, and I stayed in the offensive room more than the defensive room because I wanted to make sure there was a balance that the defense, that the offense, and I always told the offense, hey, "Look, we want to do all these things, but at the end, you got to protect the defense." You 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 can't you you, you th this got to be complementary football. You have to protect the defense. You you can't go out here and not make first downs and put the defense on the field. It don't work that way. You got it. You you got to take time off the clock. We we got to possess the ball, you know, at times. So we got to protect these guys so they're fresh. And so not being conservative by the stretch of the imagination. So situation. Situational football is very important. You know, how do you play in certain situations? That to me was critical. And the coaches needed to know this is how we're going to do this. You can, you can, you can put in the system and you can have, you know, the players going in and out, you can do all that. But the situational football, I'm going to be part of that big time. And you need to know this is what I like. And I want to know when it's, hey, when it's fourth and one, what is our best play? And I don't want to throw the football. How do we make a yard? How do we make a yard? 
when it's defensively, when it's fourth and three or fourth and one, how are we stopping them, coach? How are we going to stop them? I want to know. What, what, what's your best front? What are we going to do to stop these guys? So that's where I got involved, you know, more than anything else. I, I got involved with the meat and the potatoes of it. You can have all these, you can have all these calls on offense, all these guys, but at the end of the day, coach, it's third and seven. What are we doing? We got to stop them. What you got? Offense. We got to convert this one. It's third and 10, man. What you got, coach? So I put them in, I put the stress on them that way. It's fourth and five. Coach, we're down. We got to go for it. What you got? That's the game you got to play as the head coach. And then, and then you live with it. You go, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm good. So then when they make the call, it's like, we've already rehearsed this. It's not like shocking to me. It's like, we talked about this. I'm good. I signed off on it. Now, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If we, if, you know, if, if they stop us, they stop us. Okay, I can live with that. But it won't be haphazard. You know, we all agreed. And at the end, I got him. I'm the one that has to sign the check and go, hey, man, okay, I'm good with that. Let's go. No doubt. No doubt. Let me, um, on a follow up to that, as you are now back in the analyst space, what have you learned watching other teams at all levels that has been uh, uh, eye opening? It's like you've seen a ton of things, but things that are like, huh, if I go back, like we're stealing that. Like well, no, I, I think what you realize is that, I mean, you only can do what the players can do. And I, I think more than anything else, at every level, college, first of all, the college, if you can't score 35 points, you have no chance of winning. Zero. You, you got to have 35 points b before you even have a conversation. You're not winning games 17 to 10 anymore. You got to be in the 30s. How do you get to the 30s? You got to have a quarterback. If you don't have a quarterback, the field's 150 yards long. You just, you can't, you, you ain't going to survive it. And you look at all these quarterbacks now, all these young quarterbacks in college. I mean, pro football's getting guys. I mean, it's just, and the even in pro football, the ones that don't have quarterbacks, they got no shot. You can't move the ball. The players are too good. You got to have that guy. This guy, he plays with the ball. He affects everybody on the team more so, more more than ever before, because it's a passing lead. Why you have to score points? If you can't score, you ain't gonna win a lot. Of, you're not gonna win. At the end of the day, I mean, the two highest scoring teams last year were like. Kansas City averaged, what, almost 31 points. You had Dallas. You had the Eagles, 28 points. I mean, when I was in the league in 1977, you scored 20 points. Woo. You were good. You, you'd win a lot of games, 17 to 6, 17 to 9. You can't do that. I mean, you might have a game where you're just, you know, but – it, it, it's just things have changed. Things have changed, coach. Yeah. Let me um, ask this one. I always am curious what people say when I ask about a fail failure that has been transformational in their approach or their growth. Are there uh, is there one? Are there a couple that you lean on as a way to to point to this is what was really important and how I developed? Yeah, I think I've always say you know. I don't consider it a failure. The only, the only failure in life is when you quit. That's failure. It's when you tap out. You can't tap out. That's the one thing I've always said. You did that. You, there's no option. When you start something, you got to finish. 
If you don't finish and you tap out, you fail. You fail. If you finish and the score wasn't like you like or the situation, okay, you have a setback. You have a setback. Life's about setbacks. It really is. What do you do when, it, when, when, when you have a setback? How do you react to that? And I, I think I always reflect on, and I think most people need to do this. I've done this numerous times where I came from. Where I came from. That gives me strength. Right? Because where I came from, the things that I've been fortunate enough to accomplish with the help of others should have never happened. The odds of that happening, not very good. But see, the thing I learned at a young age, very young age, I didn't care about the odds because I was willing to bet on me. And I tell people that all the time. In life, one day you got to go look yourself in the mirror and that person staring back at is you. And you got to tell yourself, you know what? I'm good enough and I'm going to bet on me. And that's what I did. I bet on me. I didn't care what anybody else said. I said, I'm betting on me and I'm going to do the work to make sure I'm prepared when the opportunity presents itself that I'll have a chance. That's all I ever want. Just give me a chance, right? And that's what's great about athletics. Every situation is a chance. It's a chance. And it doesn't matter what the score is, how many you've won, how many you lost. You have an opportunity when it presents itself. And what do you do? What do you do with that opportunity? And that's, that's to me, is, is, is the essence of, of athletics. It's the essence of life, to be quite honest. And sometimes you stumble. But failure, that ain't part of the deal. You only fail when you tap out and you quit. And you can't do that. That's not an option. And if you understand that, you'll find a way to pick yourself up and you got to dust yourself off and you go, okay. And that's, look, <laughs> I didn't get drafted. I was not a draft choice. They blackballed me because of my, my desire to question authority. That's what we were doing when I was coming out. You couldn't ask the coach why because you were, you were threatening authority. And so that's what happened. That's why I moved to so many schools, right? Because I was always asking why. Well, you couldn't ask why when I was growing up in Athletic. You couldn't ask the coach why. It's like, why? Now you get, if, if you're a good coach now, you better tell the players why first. It used to be, this is how you do it. This is what we're going to do. This is why we do it. That's how it used to be. Now the why is first. So I don't get drafted. There were 12 rounds. I was supposed to get drafted in the second round. I don't get drafted. I go in as a, a free agent to Philadelphia. A free agent. The odds of me making it are zero, 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 zero. Whatever the, the odds were was zero, zero, zero. Not only did I make it, I was the only rookie in the league to start a corner and never missed a game and never missed a practice. You know why? Because I bet on me. <laughs> I didn't care about what anybody said. Just get me in camp. That's all I want. And Coach Vermeil gave me that opportunity. He recruited me out of high school to UCLA. I didn't go. I went to CAF. And you spin it forward five years later, he's the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. I had about five teams I could go to. I go to him because I know the man. And I told him when I looked him in the face, I said, Coach, all I want is a chance. And I told him this, Coach, no, 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 no. I want a chance to start. Not a chance to make the team. I want an opportunity to start. He looked at me in the eye and he said, if you're the best player, you're going to start. Second week in training camp. Second week in training camp, we had six preseason games back in the day that I played. Six. We had training camp two months. Second week training camp, he comes over when I'm stretching. He hugs me. He says, you tell your mom you ain't going to be back home until after Christmas. He had already told me, you're making the team. I said, what, coach? He said, yeah, now I got to get you ready to start. That's a true story. But I bet on me. 
And I had a man that gave me an opportunity that said, you know what? I'll give you every opportunity. That's all I want. That's all you want is a chance. And then from there, you got to go do it. You got to show up. Let me follow up with this as we're coming to the end. You, you led that story with coming from where I came from, the chances were zero. Yes. But you bet on yourself. So I have two questions that are interconnected. One, for those that don't know, right, growing up on a peninsula, it's a very small place. Uh, not a lot of people coming around to recruit athletes. Uh, but it, it, what did your, uh, let's call it youth experience here, do to give you that drive? And what adult influences, you already mentioned uh, Coach Albert, yeah. Uh, in what way did the people that were around you and helping mold you create that confidence that you could offer to others as hell coaching strategy? Well, it was normal. It was just a life in general. Look, I grew up in the sixties during the civil rights movement in April. I'll be 70 years old. Okay. So I grew up in the sixties. President Johnson in 1968 signed a desegregation bill. I got bust from Seaside. I grew up in Seaside. I got bust to Monterey High. I was supposed to go to Seaside. I got bust to Monterey High School from Seaside. I caught a bus in the morning at 6.30 every morning, riding the bus to go to high school. High school in was 10, 11, 12. So I grew up in Seaside, went to all the Seaside schools, was supposed to go to Seaside High, and I get picked as one of the minority uh, minorities that need to go to Monterey. So and now I go to Monterey, Monterey. Yeah, and for those of you that aren't aware, you probably could have walked to Seaside High in about five minutes. I just, it, it, yeah, I mean, it just, it, you know. And so now I'm over there and I'm going, are you kidding me? Right? And it was the greatest thing ever happened to me. Right? Because now I'm in an environment where I'm like, oh, I, I went to Highland Elementary School. And Martin Luther King, before it was Martin Luther King Junior High School, it was Portola. And when Dr. King was assassinated, they changed the name to Martin Luther King. So I grew up right there. We, I still own the house that I grew up in on Highland Street, right? And so all I wanted to ever do was be an athlete. And what propelled me to do that? Real simple. And this is, this is the truth. I watched a movie called The All-American. It was Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe, All-American. Burt Lancaster was Jim Thorpe. And I watched that guy as a young kid, and I went, man, he did everything. He could play all the sports. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be like that guy. No one told me that. I just said, I want to be like that guy, like that guy Jim Thorpe. I want to play all the sports, and that's what I did. Anything with a ball, I played. I, my father didn't coach me. My mom was working. My father was working. I just played. From elementary to junior high school, played. Played any, when it, baseball season, played baseball. Basketball, played basketball. Track, run track. Football, played football, right? And so in my wildest dreams, you know, I grew up and the Dallas Cowboys were my favorite team. I like the Dallas Cowboys. Love Bob Hayes, war number 22, Olympian, right? Tom Landry. I wanted to play for the Dallas Cowboys. And anybody on this peninsula will tell you, once I got into high school, I dubbed myself Mr. Bob because I wore number 22, right? That was my number. And whatever I could do in sports to 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 go down that road, I was going to do it. Whatever sacrifice I had to make. I thought growing up when you watch, I, I didn't never been a pro athlete. I never been to a professional game. I just watched it on TV like everybody else. And I always thought athletes, I said, you know, those guys don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't use bad language. That, that, that was my perception of an athlete. I didn't know any better. And so I said, if that's what I got to do, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and I didn't do it. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't use bad language. I'm 70 years old. I still don't do that stuff. 
Cause that's what I thought. Cause no one told me like, no one like, Hey, this is what you know. I wouldn't do. I just kind of did it on my own. Cause I thought that's what it was. That's why I watch television. Right. This is what I'm seeing. I said, this is what you got to do to get there. And so lo and behold, I, you know, was a pretty good athlete at all the sports. I was just pretty good. I had this gift and I've seen this in my lifetime. I've seen it at every level, high school level, college level, professional level. Talent could be a curse. Talent can be a curse if you don't use it correctly. I had some talent. I had some talent and I knew it. I didn't know how much talent I had, but I knew I had enough talent because I was good at everything. And when I walked on the field, I thought I was the best guy on the field in any sport. That was just my mindset. I'm, I'm, I wasn't afraid to, I love to compete. I love to compete. You know, when I was a 10th grader, I said, I'm playing varsity. I'm not playing freshman ball. That was, that was that, when I came out of ninth grade, when I went to Monterey, I said, I'm playing varsity. Man, I ain't playing. JV, what's that, right? That was just me. In football, basketball, any of that stuff, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm playing varsity. I don't know what these guys talking about. And I did. <laughs> but I went to college uh, as a freshman. I said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm playing on, I'm not playing on the, the look squad. I'm, I'm, I'm playing on the big, with the big boys, right? Because that was my mindset. See, the thing that I had, I love to compete. I love to compete. Just tell me where, tell me what time to show up and we'll go compete. Because the thing I knew that I had, no one was going to outwork me. Now, there were more talented players. There were stronger players. There were faster players. But the work ethic, no one's going to outwork me. And here's what I felt. If I fail, or not fail, if I stumble, it won't be because I didn't put the work in. You have to, <laughs> you know, you, you have to put the work in. You have to sacrifice something to get something. You know, it, it, it's, it's, I say this every once in a while, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be, I'm being funny with it. I'm a Catholic, okay? But let's just say, you know, growing up, you go to the, you, you go to the, to the Baptist church sometimes, you know, you just go to church and you hear the Baptist preacher and he's preaching about heaven. And he's getting the he's getting the, he's getting the congregation. Oh, everybody wants to go there just like this, and there's no disease, and you live forever, and you, all these great things are in heaven, right? And he said, "Who wants to go?" And he and the crowd is just putting their hand, yeah. And then he asks him this question: "Who's willing to die?" Everybody put their hands up. I say that in a sense: What are you willing to give up? to be successful now. What are you willing to give up now to be successful later on? Most people are not. I was different. I was different that way. I'm willing to give up all this to go here. That was just me. Nobody taught me that. I just kind of fell into it because that was how I thought. And as I've gone through life, it is always about that. Are you willing to bet on you? And what are you willing to give up to move up? You got to give something. It ain't free. And that's what people, that's where people struggle. We live in a world where you touch a button and you get it right now. Nobody wants to wait. Nobody wants to like, oh, I need it right now. No. It don't work that way. You there, there's a struggle. There will be struggles, and that that kind of defines who you are, right? And and that's just kind of been my life, you know. That at the end, it's like I'm betting on me. I'm just betting on me, and I don't have to have anybody's support because at the end, I got to do it. <laughs> you got to go do it, man. And it's, it's great when you have people that back in all that, but at the end, you have to actually do the work. You got to put in the time. Like I always say in sports, I'll, I'll equate it to, to football. The grass knows when you've been there. 
The grass knows. In other words, the work you put in on the grass, the practice time, with, with not playing in games, the off season, all that stuff, man, the grass knows. It knows when your feet are there and when you're working, right? You can't cheat the grass. If you're playing basketball, you can't cheat the floor. It knows if you've been there or not. And if you just think you're going to show up and go do this, good luck. Don't work that way. And that's the hardest part about it all. You know, now some people are talented enough and you see them, well, gonna, but eventually it catches up to them. It just does. And, and that was just my mindset. No one taught me that. You know, I just kind of figured it out on my own and just said, if I ever don't achieve something, it won't be because of lack of effort. It was like, you know what? Okay, you, you need to go try something else. But it, I don't want to ever question myself, well, I didn't put the work in. Uh, you got to put the work in. And sometimes you don't see the result as quick as you'd like. You know, we want result. We are a result-orientated society. I want it right now. Well, sometimes it don't come right now. And that's just, that's how I'm wired. Yeah. Well, I think you, I mean, the way in which that entire anecdote plays out, the message is, you can't cheat the grass. If you're not willing to put the work in, you're not going to you're not going to achieve your potential number 1, but number 2, the other thing you said that was super important other than work ethic is just I love to compete. Oh. And I would imagine that over the years your best athletes have been wired that way. They're playing every sport. They're they're making up games to compete in and practice. They're having secret competitions which then raises the level of everybody else. Yeah. And when you compete, sometimes the other guy's going to get you. Or the other, or, the, or if it's women, the other woman's going to get you. You know, and it's just, that's part of it. But it's like, when the game starts and you're prepared, and I say this as a player, there's a, there's a you have anxiety. You need anxiety. Because anxiety gets you, it's not fear. There's a difference between being fear. I, I tell people, when you're afraid, you're not prepared. When you're afraid, you're not prepared. You have anxiety, and that's like, okay, just, okay. Because you can't wait, right? You, you're you ready to go. Fear is a whole different deal. When you have fear, you ain't prepared. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and I think right? your anxiety, as you describe it, is the I'm ready to go. Like, it's yeah. game time. I'm prepared. Let's go see what happens. You want, you know, I tell people all the time, you want anxiety. That's a good feeling. It ain't a bad feeling. It's a good feeling. You you want it. You want it like, oh, you know. I mean, just everything. When I do things, there's, but I'm real calm. I have anxiety, but I'm calm. It's like, hey, man, okay. Because you have to be able to process information very quickly. How fast, you know, how fast can you process the information? And how can, how can, how can you go from one play to another because once that one's over it's gone you gotta move the next one and the position i play corner man you're out there with the landmines i mean you're one way of you're one play away from being on the bad bad end of the highlight field you know because you're way out there it's just you and this receiver out there <laughs> and it's like here we go right it's just it, 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 it's just a wonderful thing when you enjoy it but you got to enjoy it. And sometimes they get you. But the key is when they get you, what you going to do? That's your setback that you talked about. Adversity strengthens. Let me ask one more question. I'm going to let you get back to your life because I know you got to travel soon. Um, what is something that you have most recently changed your mind on? And it doesn't have to do anything with football, but it's like, hey, I used to be dug in over here and now I'm over here and here's why to the why question where you've actively changed your mind on something intentionally because you've grown, because you got new information, whatever it is. Well, I, I think in today's world with the, with just athletics, and I said it earlier in, in some of the conversation we were having, you got to tell these athletes why first. The what, the how, and the why, they don't work no more. They don't work no more. That's my era. You got to tell them why in the beginning. And I've always said this, it's great because you're giving them information. 
They want to know why. When you're getting ready to do something, why are we doing that? You couldn't ask that question. That wasn't even a part of the question. You never could ask a coach why. Well, now you got to tell them why in the beginning. Right? And, and, and so that's the athlete we have today because they're, they, they have much. They, there's so many people that are giving them information now. They want to know why we're doing this. Why are you doing this, coach? Well, these other guys are doing that. Why are we doing this? Right? I mean, it's just, they all talk now. They all communicate. Before, you had to pick up a phone. You couldn't call. But now they got it on tape. They got a phone. Just, we doing this. Well, coach, why are they doing that? Why are we not doing that? You got to have answers. <laughs> it's just, you, it's, so you better understand that. Well, I think on that, and we'll wrap with this, is <clears throat> the world's changed. They yes. do have information at their fingertips. When you grew up and then when I grew up subsequently as a King alumnus as well, uh, the the teachers were the master of all information. We, yes. That's no longer the case. So Ooh. ultimately, to your point, you better be prepared to answer the why question, not because they're being combative, no. because they want to know so they can walk alongside of you in that journey. That's exactly right. And, 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 and I always tell them, I, I would start every meeting out with you. Man, this is why we're doing this. And, and give them examples. We're doing this because they do this. Got it, coach. And this is where the trust comes in, right? It's just, it's part of it. It's part of the process of what you do. And it's just, you know, sports is just, it, it, it's a big part of our society now. These kids have more pressure on them now than they've ever had because of all the noise that comes outside of the building. That didn't happen before. I mean, everyone's got a comment, right? Everybody can get to an athlete now because they, they live on a screen and they see all this and how you keep them engaged with what you want rather. And that's the hardest thing is the noise outside the building now. It's in your building. It didn't used to get in. Now it's in. How do you deal with that? Right? How do you deal with all the noise? Well, I think that's a great place to stop, Coach, because that's a question that people can sit with and know exactly what you're talking about. And the way you deal with the noise is different in every situation. But you better have an answer to that. So. <laughs> yeah, you better have an answer. That's the fact. Yeah. Better have yeah. an answer. I appreciate taking the time, Coach. It's been a, been a long time trying to get this done. And uh, no. thanks for making it happen. Thank you. Anytime. And good luck to you guys the rest of the way, huh?